How many of you, as you read the chapter on tools of maturity and stages of maturity, reflected on your own education and what it was like? I see several nods, a few hands. Is there anyone who would share with us what tool, tool or tools of maturity you feel your schooling, I'm not going to call it education, I'm going to call it schooling, uh, emphasized or focused on? Lorna. Intellect. Intellect. Yeah. Okay, I saw Marcia nodding. Will you share what you felt yours? I put, don't mean to put you on the spot, but I did, huh? <laughs> um, what my thoughts were about. What, what your schooling focused on, which tools of Intellect. maturity? Intellect? Yeah. Trina? I feel very fortunate. I must have had a very progressive grade school because it was very, very balanced. You're younger than I am, too. It's a very small school in Roseburg, which is not, you know, out there. And we had yoga in my class. Yoga? Oh, my goodness. I had no idea how I worked. Priya, what did you feel? Well, you know, I, I moved almost every year of my life, so I had really different experiences. But by the time I got into a boarding school in, in high school, which was a convent school, incidentally, I really think they focused on everything. I mean, we were really encouraged to be involved in sports and, and um, but intellect, you know, intellect was probably the main focus. Maybe not the emotions. I don't think they focused <laughs> on feeling. I think this is uh, the typical report we get from Western, edu Western education. And Western education doesn't only include um, uh, Europe and the U.S., but many other countries, for example, I'm familiar slightly with India, and the, certainly they have adopted the English form of education very much an intellectual emphasis. And I know the first time that it dawned on me that there was more uh, to education than that and more to uh, learning than that was actually, I was a college graduate. And I had a job working at the Georgia Retardation Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was very progressive for the time, early 70s. And, uh, when, you know, every all the public institutions were flush with money about right then. And so they were hiring, this was an, uh, an actual residential facility for children, as they called them then, retarded, and who could not, you know, be at home, couldn't, there weren't the, there weren't, families weren't able to cope or meet their needs. And it was uh, supposedly very enlightened, well it was for, for what had preceded it, in that it wasn't big institutions, it was cottages and a residential campus, and each cottage had 18 or 20 kids, and uh, sort of like duplexes, and long story short, there were professionals who came during the day, such as nurses, there were schools for those who could go to school uh, with teachers, but they hired the, all this slew of other college graduates, of, which, of whom I was one, who were uh, residential care counselors, and we came in the morning, and if we were on morning shift, we got them up, got them dressed, fed them breakfast, took them to school, or took them to their doctor's appointments. The idea was to have um, people with some education interacting with them all the time. Well, these kids range from profoundly to, uh, these were the terms from the that day, from profoundly to mildly retarded. And in our co particular cottage, only a handful went to school. Most of them were there all day, and uh, we, were, we provided them with recreational opportunities. We took them on field trips, etc. Some of the kids had no verbal skills whatsoever. And there was one little girl I can uh, name Barbie. I have a photo of her. I'll never forget her. She was about 11 or 12 years old when I came and was 14 when I left. And she was completely nonverbal. And you could not, she had a very strong will. And she was a quite happy person generally. Uh, but when she wasn't getting what she wanted, her, her, both her physical being, she was so strong, she was very wiry and strong, and her uh, will were so powerful that, you know, one person could not force her. It would take two, and you wouldn't want to force a child anyway, but we're talking to simple things like going to eat dinner. And if she was completely happy with the activity that she was in, 
she didn't have the reasoning power that you could say, but the dinner won't be there in another hour and you'll be hungry before you go to bed. That was impossible with her. And so I learned to communicate with her by just, it was, I had never done this, and this just shows how either retarded I was or my schooling or something, but just to let go of all reason and just get into the heart and feel, okay, what is she feeling right now? And can I make a connection with her over what she's doing, connect with her, and then with my eyes appeal to her feelings come with me now, we've got something good to do. And there would be a trust that she would like wherever I was taking her. And it was such, it was so enlightening for me because I, I didn't really know about getting into the heart and communicating through the heart. It was just all brand new to me and I realized there was a whole universe that I didn't know too much about. You know, that I'd heard lip service paid to it, but I hadn't been taught how to do it. And just, I think the Education for Life book puts it so eloquently that um, education focuses so much on transmitting information and even, not just information, but even reasoning, logic, um, um, what do you call it, uh, the thing we really want to teach teachers to teach isn't just a bunch of facts, but... Uh, I can only think of reasoning right now, it'll come to me. Problem solving, thank you. Problem solving, but usually that's taught too from the intellect. And there's too little time spent on how to absorb teaching. How do you absorb it? How do you learn it? How to concentrate? How to be calm enough? How to um, deal with your own emotions so that you can learn to problem solve? Because when you're in fear, can you problem solve? Of course not. I was just really touched by what Mary was sharing this morning about in her little um, area of the room where she has the balls and where the kids practice the, the drain technique that we learned because she's teaching them, or not just teaching them, but she's also providing the atmosphere in which they're practicing because telling them won't, won't do any good. She's providing the atmosphere where they're actually practicing techniques that get them into the heart, that calm them down, that enable them to absorb the wonderful activities and um, more than information, the opportunities for creativity and everything else that she's giving them. These are tools that they, kids can take throughout all of life, and they do. I hope maybe Trina will have time this afternoon. She's going to be speaking on the foundation years, but um, maybe she'll have time to share something, uh, an incident with her uh, Will Year's child and he went to school all the way through here and something he shared in a paper when he went out to um, public schools and he had to write a paper on things and all this came out uh, that showed that he had really taken these tools and it's incorporated, it's, it's actually it's just part of these kids being once they've been in this sort of environment where they're taught holistically. Now this is a term that was tossed around. This term was being used when I was graduating from college Holistic education, and I remember that just thrilled me to the core. I knew already before I even met Barbie that I, I lacked something. <laughs> that my education and my, uh, uh, that I, I actually, my development lacked something. And I knew that holistic education was what I was really passionately interested in, but I didn't know what that really meant. I don't think many people knew what that really meant. I think it's taken decades for us to, to understand that. I know the first conference I went to, a um, large conference on holistic education, every single, uh, and it was a three-day conference and we were busy from morning to night with keynote speeches and breakout sessions. Every single one was about educating the heart, developing character, t teaching the whole child, incorporating body, and every single one was a lecture in which there was absolutely no participation, no movement, no, it was just a lecture, just like we were still in college except for two. And one of those was a brain gym by Carl Hannaford and one was on music uh, by Don, the guy who created the Mozart effect, copyrighted the Mozart effect term. Can't think of his name right now. Thank you, Don Campbell. But other than that, it was all lectures. Fifteen years passed, and, I, and all that time I hadn't gone to another national conference, and I went to one in um, Asilomar, actually, the coast of California. And 
I could not believe the change. Maybe 30% of the breakout sessions and the keynotes were like that. Yeah. And there were participatory, the key, before the keynote speeches there was music, there was getting up and moving around. And I thought, this is great because it's really, it's not just lip service anymore, we're learning how to do it. So when you think, when you, back then when we thought about holistic education, I think we thought about mind, heart, and sometimes they added in spirit or soul. Mind, heart, and spirit. And so what does that mean exactly? And then later on, I found out more about the Waldorf system. When I was in college, by the way, I heard of Rudolf Steiner, I heard of the Waldorf system, and I just really was fascinated. Every time I saw a reference to it, I thought, I want to learn about that. That's got something in it for me. And do you know, I would go to the card catalog in every library and look him up, no books. I would go to the, you know, back, the, no internet, guys. This is how. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, no. I didn't know how, how to find out anything about him. You know, if I'd lived in New York, I would have gone to a, one of the offbeat metaphysical bookstores. But in South Carolina, I did, I was, it was hopeless. And I think, you know, it was my destiny not to find out about it because I probably would have gone somewhere and, and studied that. Um, but their, tech, their philosophy, the Steiner philosophy, the Waldorf approach, is very similar to the education for life. And there are, they don't call them tools of maturity, but they do talk about the stages of development. And they talk about the first six years being physical or body primarily just as we do. So these are the years when the kids are just learning body control and body mastery. And you know that if you've been in the preschool, right? As, as very young children, every, they have to experience everything through the body. They put every single thing you give them in their mouths, don't they? And it's not just a bad habit. It's they need to physically experience the world. And then the next six years, uh, education for Life and Waldorf also agree are the feeling years. And these are the years when the children are, it's the opportune time to educate the heart. And what that means we'll talk more about. But it's the time when feeling becomes so strong. It's the time we, we just heard about the child falling down and, oh, where does it hurt? Everywhere. And they're just learning one thing, a vocabulary for all of their emotions. But they're also learning to, they have them and to identify them and the subtle differences between, you know, a very young child, it's, it's, I'm getting my needs met or I'm not. And then the older they get, it gets more refined. There becomes in jealousy and affection and generosity and selfishness, all of those things start to come in. It's important to know that when we speak of the tool of maturity of feeling and developing feeling in the education for life system, this is defined as calm feeling calm feeling in the heart. So we're talking about um, those feelings that are also the fruits of meditation. Love, peace. It's not talking about um, excitement. It's not talking about jealousy, hatred. Those are um, in this vocabulary and semantically. When we speak of emotions, we're talking about those. When we talk, speak of feeling, we're talking about a calm receptivity of the heart. That, that ability that I was learning as this counselor who knew so little in the Center for Re um, Georgia Retardation Center, that ability to calm my heart enough to become centered enough to feel what an, this child was feeling and be able to respond to her and communicate with her through the eyes, through that totally nonverbal, through that tool. And then the next six years, uh, from 12 to 18, and I want to emphasize all of these are two, it's not zero through six, it's not birth through six, it's two six, through five years old, and then it's six through 11 years old, and then 12 through 17 years old. Now this is where we come to a difference with the Waldorf system, because we in Education for Life say all of these are the will years. Uh, in the Waldorf system they do have the will years, but I think it's just a couple of years, 12 to 14. I believe that's correct. Um, I don't want to speak for them, but I know it's not the whole, the whole time. And then from 18 to 24, the intellectual years. And so the will years, and you all, all of you, how many of you have ever had a teenager in your home? Okay, you know what I'm talking about then, don't you? And they, they're having to learn to exert, they're trying to exert their willpower on the world. And oftentimes, 
it's a, it, the only way they have to exert it is against something or against you. But they're just practicing doing that. And as you'll hear from Sandy and Priya both this after, the, later on this morning, they're going to talk a little bit about how to harness that willpower and give them chances to use it in positive ways. And then you think of the intellectual years. That's the, the years, you know, the European coffee houses when they would go to university and sit in the coffee houses and discuss, discuss deep in, intellectual issues. And we have coffee houses again, and they're in Starbucks on their computer and discussing the issues. I know that I had one student I taught um, just right before I came to uh, Portland, actually, at Living Wisdom School in California at Nevada City. And she, I thought, was the she was very interesting because her two really strong tools of maturity were feeling and uh, will, I would have said. Now, I don't mean that she didn't have a, a very healthy, vital body. I don't mean that she didn't have a good mind. I just mean that these were the tools that I saw her just, she would just soar in. You know, if she had a chance to be in a play or express art or move her body like expressing a, a feeling or, or even an emotion, that was just that was her all over again. And she also had a very strong will. Well, when I heard that she was at the University of Cal well, I knew she was at the University of California at Santa Cruz, but when I heard that she had decided that she was going to major in astrophysics, mm -hmm. you could have knocked me over with a feather. I thought, well, what kind of education for life teacher am I? Because I, d I had no idea that this child, this person's preferred tool of maturity, preferred modality, was intellect, and wouldn't it have to be to study astrophysics? I mean, I puzzled over that for two or three years, I have to tell you. But I also have to tell you that she's living, she's American, she's living in Brazil right now, and she earns a living by uh, telecommuting with Google, but her whole life passion, all her energy and time, is in being a professional dancer. <laughs> so. Yes, so I, I wasn't that far wrong. You know, her strong tool of maturity was will. But when she got into the intellectual years, she was so fascinated by the intellectual things that she was learning that she exerted her will to. I'm going to major in astrophysics. This morning, I had your very first thing fill out a form that asked about some preferred tools of um, what some of your own preferences were. So if you, you don't have to look at it because you might be able to remember, but if you want to look at it, do. And the first one was, which activity would you prefer in your leisure time? A board game? Listening to, okay, a board game. What do you think might be the predominant tool you use when you play a board game? Predominant. Intellect. Intellect. Listening to music or watching a musical. What do you think might be the feeling? A sport. That's pretty easy. Body. Uh, and then D, a board game, a sport, or practicing music would be fine if there's an element of competition and possibly winning. Who is that? Will. Will. Okay. So as you look at what you check for each one, if you checked A three times, perhaps your preferred tool of, of, of uh, maturity. Oh, actually, I got these out of order, didn't I? Three is out of order. So if you checked A with number one and A with number two and with three um, taking a class that enables you to enter an accelerated learning program, if you chose those three, probably your preferred tool of maturity is intellect. If you chose B, listening to music, playing with someone younger who's not a close friend, or acquiring three different pets and carrying them for, caring for, for them all, Helen, what's your tool of maturity? <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing her because of her two little doggies. <laughs> um, if you chose C, a sport, C, riding a bike, or uh, B, joining a sports team with a great coach, we know that you love the physical. And uh, if you chose D, uh, trying to conquer a challenge, for example, riding the bike a certain di distance without sitting down or building a Legos tower taller than the last one. Or in the last one, any of the above would be a good challenge. If that is what uh, rings your chimes, then probably your predominant tool is will. And does everybody have a predominant tool? I kind of think so. I think some people may be so close on two that it's hard to distinguish. 
But um, in my observation with all the time, all the teaching and all the staff I've worked with, I'm able to always see that there are two that sort of predominate. And what I want to emphasize here, it, we're not talking about what you're good at. I remember when we were very, the book very first came out, Education for Life, in 86, and I was teaching the next year a child who um, was very bright. I had her in sixth, fifth or sixth grade. And she loved to read. And I just remember I could feed her all my favorite books, you know, um, Witch of Blackbird Pond and, you know, all those books for that age, the, the Newberry type books. And she would just eat them up and come back and say, oh, that was great. What can I read next? And so I had her classified in my mind as a tool, as, as being her preferred modality was intellect. And then I had her again in ninth grade. I had a seventh, eighth, ninth grade combination. And we let her come because she wanted to be at the school. She wanted, she, she was in this unique situation where she spent a year with one parent in Nevada City and another year on the East Coast with the other parents. So she was back and forth. And so she had just been away and she really wanted to come to our school one more year. And so I said, because she could work independently and I knew I could have her uh, working with someone else for algebra and some other classes, I said, okay, you can be part of the class. Several years had passed, I'd learned a lot. And what I noticed was the first field trip that we went on, and we went down to the river, and we were swimming, and I just, I was watching her because it was so beautiful. She was a 14-year-old girl, and here she was. We were in this, you know, like a little pond swimming hole in the river, and she was jumping up and diving in. And I could just see that she was, the joy was, and energy was flowing through her in a way I had never seen it in her interaction in the water. And I thought, well, that is really interesting. And then I found out she was taking dance lessons and, and, and that she also loved gymnastics. And I thought, hmm, now that is even more interesting. And as I watched her that year, I started to learn that her preferred tool of, mat of maturity was really the body. That just because she was really, really good and really, really smart in intellectual activities, that wasn't what brought her the joy. So when you're trying to evaluate the children in your class, by evaluate is really the wrong word. When you're trying to discern what is their preferred tool, don't so much look at what they're good at, but look at what, it, in what activity the energy just flows through them, joyful energy just flowing. And that, if, when you see that, and say your preferred tool, tool of modality is feeling, and say there's his will. Start thinking about, do I do enough challenges in my class? Do I give them opportunities to compete against themselves? Because oftentimes we don't. I know that um, one year I was teaching with um, a co-teacher down at Ananda Village and he was very much, very well-rounded. I mean, some people are so well-rounded it's hard to distinguish what is their, only they can tell you where they feel the joy, really. Uh, but he was very well-rounded, but still his preferred tools and modality were will and body. He loved to build and manifest things. And we were co-teaching. We added on this big deck to our classroom that year. And so we met halfway into the fall, as we always did, and discussed all the kids in the class and thought about what is their preferred tool. And then we looked at all the activities we did and thought, are we meeting the, everyone's needs? And I know there was one child in the class that we both agreed, very, very bright, very, very athletic, but we both agreed that her tool of act of her preferred modality was feeling. And we realized that we weren't doing enough in that area, and we thought, let's do more art. We need to do more art. It's not either of our, um, we both loved it, but it wasn't the first thing we'd lead with. So let's do more art, and let's, you know, for circle time, let's do some more of the feeling activity thing. So let's do the the tree meditation, which is something that uh, Toby Morehouse came up with. So the kids go out, this, this they could do on that wonderful campus, they go out, they find a tree to climb, they, have, they cannot climb a tree where they can see anyone else, and they have to be alone, they can't climb a tree with anyone, and then they just spend 10 minutes up there in silence. And then we tell them things they can do, but of course we have no control over whether they're doing, they can hug the tree, they can talk to the tree, they can feel the bark, they can look. And it was interesting because at the end of the, um, the year, we had the, we had, had the kids journal every day. Well, not every day, but every week. What was your favorite activity of the week? And 
one of the favorite activities that, that was over everything that year. This is, these are fifth and sixth grade children now. They're getting ready to move into the will years. We did a ropes course. You know what the ropes courses are. Challenging and you know, I'll never forget jumping out of the tree into the tr with the trapeze. Woo. And that, I mean, all of us were affected for weeks with that. And so about, I mean, nine out of, eight out of 10 children in the class drew the ropes course. That was their outstanding event, their memory of the year. But one, little, one girl, and she wasn't even the girl that we did these activities for. I'll never forget she, this beautiful piece of art that was just a branch with leaves. And this is what she showed for the, the activity, her favorite activity of the year. And I, we said, well, what is it? She said, well, it was the tree meditation. Mm -hmm. And this is a girl who, by the way, is a horsewoman. She loves horses. She's grown now, married, has a horse. And I just thought, ah, oh, just think, if we hadn't made the effort to think, are we including all the tools and maturity in our teaching, she wouldn't have had that experience. Now, we also can use every tool and every modality when we're teaching academics. So, for example, when you're teaching math, and I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, and Karen may be going to talk about this, but it'll be a different... Oh, going to. <laughs> it'll be a different slant. You, we can't hear things too many times if we're hearing them for the first time, right? So, or if we're nearly learning them. So, if you're teaching math, I remember uh, a kindergarten, first grade teacher at the village Elizabeth who would have the kids, they would get to stand, the only time in the classroom they were ever allowed to stand on the chairs was when they would be, do little simple addition problems and she'd give one a problem, one and the other a problem and then they'd have to compare the answer and whoever's answer was bigger got to stand on a chair to show it was a higher number. So this is using the body because most of what we, so much of what we have to teach in school is intellectual, isn't it? It is to, to the mind. We're, They've got to learn to read and write and compute and problem solve and apply their learning and everything. Uh, although the heart certainly enters into those things too. But this is using the body to teach math skills. Feeling, can you use feeling to teach math? Well, I just thought of one that I don't have to steal your thunder. Um, Karen will be showing us some ways to do that. But I'll show you one that I really like because in fourth, I always taught, mostly taught fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And so when you're teaching um, long division, you can use this one. Uh, I think that's going to work. Okay. It may not work. Anyway. Um, so you're teaching long division at class. Four goes into six how many times? And then what do you do? Okay. And then I was taught you bring down the five. But here's how I teach it. Oh, that two's lonely down there. Is there anybody up here who can come down and play with him? <laughs> yes, we still have a five who can come down and play with him. How many times do four go into 25? Six. Six. And six times four is? Okay, we subtract and what do we get? Oh, he's lonely. Is there anybody else who can come down and play? Yeah, there's the two. Four goes into 12. Three and three times four. You know, when you're teaching, very first teaching long division, they don't give you remainders, so it always works out. <laughs> <laughs> Later, when you can teach them that when somebody's left and they're lonely, they get to go up here and be the remainder and be with the group. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how you can use feeling to teach an intellectual skill. Well, okay class, I'm going to give you four problems. Let's see if you can finish them before break. All right, so challenge those will kids. Or you might have them compete against yourself. See if you can do one more than you did yesterday. All right? And then it, the whole thing is intellectual, so we don't have to, I tell you, we don't have to come up with ways to do that because that's what we've all mostly learned in school and we know how to do that. Yes, uh, Selene. Um, is possible to, is a kid to have to very close to tools, very close. Yes. And you can, you can really, it's not like a one common yes. choice. Yes, absolutely. Well, anything's possible, and I'm not the authority. And the book doesn't ever say that people have one in particular. Mm -hmm. Education for Life doesn't say that. But I, I feel that I, usually, the, sometimes they're too really close. 
Um, yeah, and we can talk more about that when it's not being recorded. We can talk about individuals. I don't want to, it's, you know, there's no, I don't want to have this recorded for posterity about every, uh, my opinion of different people. Okay, okay. But um, okay. let's talk about some people that have, a, 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 that public figures. <laughs> okay, so I think when I'm thinking of body, I think of Lilius Folan. Do you all know her? She was, one, she was teaching yoga back in the early 70s, and she's yeah. still teaching yoga. And she's just absolutely wonderful, but boy, watch one of her videos, and you'll, you'll see feelings right up there, too, you know. And then when I think about um, the feeling tool of maturity and thinking of public figures, I think Maya Angelou. She's on my mind right now being a, a, an African-American poet. And she's been interviewed a lot speaking about uh, the election of Obama. When I think of Will, this might be a little interesting and counterintuitive, and I wouldn't have thought this until I met her. I think of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Now, I would have thought of her as being totally about feeling and love and taking care of the downtrodden, but um, actually, Vidura and I met her at the same time in 90, oh, you've probably seen her several times, but in 90, I think it's 1990. And she walked in the room, just this teeny, little, teeny little person, bent over tiny. But she strode in that room like a soldier with so much energy. And I just could not believe, uh, what I felt from her was dynamic will. And certainly will, attuned to the will of God. Or she, she said she never did anything that Christ didn't tell her to do. But, um, but what did she use that will for? Of course she had to have great will. Look at the work that she started. And then... Uh, um, intellect. Well, we can think of a lot of people. I think of, uh, I have a slideshow where I show pictures of these people. I think of Elaine Pagels, I think is her name, who is a uh, professor at Princeton who is publishing a lot of books on uh, new understanding of Christianity based on texts that they found, <clears throat> you know, ancient texts uh, that are con uh, contemporaneous to the Bible. So, and why did I use all women? Because um, because always we can, the men are the first people that come to mind. Another um, instance in which I can think of a, a real fun way to look at tools of maturity is Star Wars. How many of you are familiar with the first Star Wars movie? Okay, so think about um, the body. Okay, do you remember Wookiee? <laughs> remember the Wookiee? Okay, think about feeling. Yoda. Think about uh, Will, and I, I say that's Han Solo. You know, he's going to do it, he's going to win, he's going to conquer, he's going to meet every challenge. And intellect, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mm -hmm. Did anybody get to read the book Homecoming that I recommended that you read before this class? It's a, uh, Karen. <laughs> reread it. <laughs> Re -read, we reread it, read it periodically. Uh, it's a book written by Cynthia Voigt, who is a Newbery winner. She won for Dicey Song, which is a sequel to Homecoming, because she should have won for Homecoming, and the committee the next year made up for it by giving it to her for Dicey Song. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. I read it. It's, it's a little, uh, Sandy thinks it's a little bit harsh for children who are young in the preschool years, um, because it's about a family who's a uh, father has been long gone and the mother's mentally ill and disappears. And so it's there and it's about their trek from a shopping center where they're abandoned in I think New Jersey to their grandmother whose house who lives on the Potomac Bay in Maryland. And it's just uh, it's a wonderful story and there are four siblings and the oldest one is Dicey and she takes care of the whole family and never lets them give up and finds the grandmother and she is such a wonderful example of, of positively developed will. And then one of the siblings is um, a musician, so she's the feeling. And one of the siblings is brilliant in school and gets scholarships. And, and the fourth one, of course, is the athlete. And I just th think it's so interesting that she has the four siblings, and they each one so beautifully typify a tool of maturity. Um, by the way, just an aside on that, because it's just I love to share these touching stories. 